Good evening, everyone. Now, I'm, I'm a, a southern country boy, and the church I grew up in, we didn't use microphones, so I speak very loud. So whoever's running everything, be aware of that. So I'll let everybody know ahead of time. I can fill this room without a microphone, no problem. Plus, I got four kids. I can fill a lot of space. So I am very honored and uh, appreciative of getting to be here this evening. I appreciate this opportunity and topic. Brother Michael, when he uh, called and invited me to, uh, to give me the opportunity to pick from, uh, invited me to be a part and gave me the topics to pick from, um, kind of lazy. I picked the one, this one, because not only did he give me my title, he gave me my three points. Right, brother? What's a sermon? Three points in a poem. Three points in a poem. Y'all been around Alvis Miller, I'm sure. You know, Alvis wrapped up with, with that poem, right? That's how I was taught to preach, although I don't use poems. I, I very rarely. Mine just usually stick to three points. So I'm very honored to get to be here tonight, and I appreciate this opportunity. Um, Tonight, my topic is Jesus' role as priest. And as we go back into the Old Testament, and and I want to begin in Zechariah chapter 6, as we go back and look at the, uh, the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 6 and starting with verse 12. And say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold the man whose name is the branch, for he shall branch out from his place and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear royal honor and sit and rule on his throne. And there shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. So we find in Zechariah a prophecy, a messianic prophecy, looking towards Christ as the priestly king. Well, when I I, I received my topic, and I, I... I'm sure many of you will guess where we'll spend the majority of our time tonight. When we speak about Jesus as priest, where do we go? Book of Hebrews, right? We're going to spend a lot of time tonight in the book of Hebrews. And so as we spend our time in the book of Hebrews, we want to go back and think about one thing. Jesus as priest and his role in that, um, as we look through the history of mankind all the way back to the beginning we find there has been some form of priesthood. uh, Before the Mosaical Law, we had the patriarchal priesthood, where the patriarch of the family was the priest of the family. We find that very much present in with Abraham and Job, right? Job, who offered sacrifices daily for his children, just in case they sinned and didn't know it. He was the family priest. He was the, the priest. Then you go into when the law comes, we find the Levitical priesthood being put into place through the law as brought by Moses. And with that, you have the Levitical priesthood and then you have the high priest, the descendants of Aaron. Tonight, as we look at this, and, and I, I hope that I, you, you will grant me this, Leeway. We're going to really focus on Jesus not as priest, but as high priest. Because that's what he is. And there's a distinction between priest and high priest. So we're going to focus on him as priest. And we're going to look at this topic of him as priest and as high priest. And we're actually going to branch out a little. I I took a little leeway and, and I hope you forgive me for that. I took a little leeway. We're going to focus on him as high priest and us, the church, as a royal priesthood. For that's what we are. And as we look at this, we're going to see that Jesus as high priest had responsibilities. 
And we as His royal priesthood, because He is our high priest, we have responsibilities as well. We're going to see that He has rights as high priest. And we as His priesthood have rights. And then the last thing we want to see again is the rewards Jesus had as he, as high priest that he shares, that he gives us as his priest. So tonight we're going to begin and looking at the responsibilities. We're going to begin in Hebrews chapter 2, looking at the responsibilities of Jesus as high priest. Hebrews chapter 2 and starting with verse 17 Hebrews chapter 2, and starting with verse 17, he says, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become merciful and faith, and faith, uh, become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. The first responsibility Jesus had in becoming high priest is he had to become like us. One of the, if, if not the biggest mystery still we look at in Scripture is trying to understand Jesus as God and man. How do you... How do you Put that together in your mind that he is fully man and yet he is fully God. That's a, that's a hard concept for us. It's a hard concept for me. And yet he, one of his first, his initial responsibility that we find in his priesthood is to become like us, to put on flesh, to become human and yet still be God. His next responsibility, and the, well, what results of that, uh, so that he can take the next step in responsibility, he does that. And if we look over in Hebrews chapter 5, starting with verse 1, we find the next step. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God. To offer gifts and sacrifices for sin, he can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins just as he does for those of the people. Now, this is speaking of the Levitical high priest, but we find a principle in here. The principle in there is simply that a priest acts on behalf of the people. And specifically, the high priest acts on behalf of the people. What was one of the, if not the main role of the Levitical high priest, was that once a year, he would be able to enter into the Holy of Holies through blood and make atonement, make a sacrifice for sin for the people. First, he had to sacrifice for himself and then go in and sacrifice for the people. Well, what does Jesus do? His responsibility is as intercessor for us. Throughout history, we, we've looked at the, the patriarchal, we've looked at the mosaical, Levitical priesthood, and now today, Jesus' role as high priest is an inter intercession role. He intercedes for us. He is that connector between us and God. And we find there is his responsibility to act as that. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 shows us an interesting point about that. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. There is one mediator. The role of the priest was mediator. He would wear the plate with the 12 stones as he entered into the Holy of Holies as a reminder to God of the tribes to keep that in the forefront of God's mind. 
He would go in and make sacrifice and mediate, if you will, between God and the tribes of Israel. Jesus goes in and He is our mediator. He is the one between us and God. And He is the only one who can fill that role. No one else can. You know, in our society, in our world, we have many religions that have tried to create new mediators. None of them, none of them can fill that role. Revelation, as the scroll was produced and the cry went out, who can open it? And John wept because no one could. He was comforted and said, there's one. There's one who stood as a lamb slain that could mediate, that could open those scrolls, that could fill that role. And that's the uh, Christ Jesus. And as He is our high priest, as we go back and we look at the Levitic, example of the Levitical priesthood, you had the high priest, the descendants of Aaron, and then you had the Levitical priesthood. That that's job was to teach the people, was to process sacrifices and these things. They operated in, under the service and under the authority of their high priest. We, as his royal priesthood, do the same thing. Go with me to he, uh, to First Peter chapter two, and I won't read all of these, but I'm going to give you all the numbers. First Peter chapter two, in verse five, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We are His royal priesthood. That's in Second or First Peter chapter 2, verse 5, verse 9 of the same chapter, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6, chapter 5 and verse 10 and verse 20 and verse 6. All references the church as a royal priesthood or as a holy priesthood. And under that, we all have responsibilities to our high priest. Matthew 28, verse 18, I won't flip there and read it, we know that. For all things have what? All authority has been given to whom? To me. Jesus speaking, right? Matthew 28, verse 18, he has all authority. He is our high priest. Therefore, we're going to operate under his authority, which means we do what he says to do, and we don't take it any farther than that. And we don't take it any shorter than that. We keep it in that realm under his authority, what he approves. Now, when you flip over to chapter 12 of the book of Romans, You'll see the sacrifices we offer. Chapter 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by the te- that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. He has responsibilities, and he lived up to his as high priest. We have responsibilities as his priesthood, and we are to live up to those responsibilities. And the core of that is to make our life a living sacrifice. To be faithful, obedient followers of the gospel. That's to put His will above ours. That's to do what He says. And that is the acceptable sacrifice that we can give. I can't give of you. I can only give of me. The beautiful thing about Christianity and the hard thing about Christianity, Christianity is a self-motivated religion. Islam can come in and they can force you to obey the tenets of Islam. And if you obey the tenets of Islam, you're good. Christianity, we can force you to obey the actions of Christianity and it's for nothing. 
if it doesn't come from the heart. Christianity is a self-motivated religion. As royal priests, we have to be self-motivated to offer the only sacrifice that I can give, which is my own self. I cannot give of you and my own obedience. So we have a responsibility there. Now we have some rights we want to look at. We want to look at Jesus' rights as high priest. And firstly, we want to establish that he has the right to be high priest. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 5 now. Hebrews chapter 5. And we're going to pick up in verse 4. Hebrews chapter 5, and where we left off a minute ago in verse 4. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from his death or from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus had a divine appointed priesthood, divinely appointed priesthood. He is divinely appointed as high priest. He didn't just force his way in. He didn't through conniving or corruption work the system till he got to where he wanted to be. God appointed him as high priest and he has every right to be there because even as son, he operated in reverence of the Father. Notice Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 13. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 13 For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. He could not be high priest here. When he was walking the face of the earth, he could not be high priest. Because then he would have been in violation of the law of God. And he committed no sin. So he couldn't be high priest here. He could only be high priest through the sacrifice of his death, through the divinely appointed placement of God. And he has every right because he fulfilled what God expected of him to do. Hebrews 9 starting with verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. When we talk about rights, you know, in our society today, that's a big topic, is it not? Our personal rights. Our, our rights according to this and our rights according to that. What is the right of the high priest? There was only one priest who was allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies. Only one. And he left office when he died. And then his successor was chosen. That was the high priest. And he was only allowed in once a year. He, had, he was the only one who had the right to enter, and he was only had the right to enter once a year. 
And what we find is Jesus as high priest through his sacrifice, he has and had and has the right to enter into the holiest of holies, the true holy of holies, the true tabernacle, the true tent. That's a major right. Because what was in the Holy of Holies, why only one could enter and why only one could enter once a year, because that's where the Ark of the Covenant was kept and what resided between the wings of the cherubim of the Ark of the Covenant. It's where the Spirit of God was, correct? Not just anybody could go there. And you know what we learn? When we study Exodus and Leviticus, not, anybody, not everybody wants to go there, right? Remember when God addressed the people of Israel and they got real scared? And they said, no, no, Moses, please, please, you go talk to him over there. Keep him away from us because we can't handle it, Right? He's earned the right and the ability to enter into the true holy of holies and remain there. We're going to look at that in just a minute. Now, because he has entered into the holy of holies as our mediator, let's look at some rights we have as his royal priesthood. First, go with me back to Romans chapter 6. If we'll go back and study... The Old Testament, we find that not everybody could be a priest, correct? Under the Levitical priesthood, under the old law. Only the descendants of Levi. And there, you had the the ones divided up that that could offer sacrifices, ones that could carry and care for the implements of the the, uh, worship and the tabernacle and these different things, they were divided up. Well... You still had to be born in that family. To establish that we are a royal priesthood, go with me to Romans chapter 6 and look at verse 1. What shall we say then? Or would he continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were baptized, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too, what, might walk in newness of life. We might be reborn. The royal priesthood of today is still by birth. Not the birth of flesh but by the birth of a new life. A new life in Christ. For once, Paul would write, for once I was alive to God, and then sin, then law came, and with law came sin. And then I died. We all do, right? And then we have to be born again to God. We have to be brought back to life through this birth. And we find we enter into that royal priesthood through that, just like the Levitical line. Now as rites of that, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16. Do you not know that you are God's temple... And that God's Spirit dwells in you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Is that me as an individual? Is that the church as a whole? Yes. And what are we? We're the the priesthood of today. And what happens at the temple? That's where worship took place, correct? Correct. They went to the temple to worship, to gather, to be with God. So what do we have as a right today as part of his priesthood? Is we have the right, we have the right 
to worship God. Right? We have the right to worship God in the right ways. We have that opportunity to be a part of His true worship because His praise and His worship was truly at the temple. It was where His name was called at the tabernacle, at the temple, at these places, they gathered to worship and we gather as the church and we have the ability to enter into his courts. When I was in South Alabama, some of you may recognize Brother Leon Eastell. Brother Leon Eastell is a retired professor from uh, Amherst University, tremendous biblical scholar, great teacher as far as evangelism and, and these things. And, and I used to love to listen to Brother Leon when he would get up to pray. Because as he would get up, every time he led prayer, he read Scripture before he led prayer. And he said it was to prepare us to enter into the throne room of God. Who has that right? Who has that right? His church, His priest have that right. And the last thing I want us to see in Second Corinthians or Second uh, Peter, chapter one on this topic. Second Peter, chapter one. Starting with verse three. His divine power has granted to us, us, all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. What do we have the right to? We have the right to every blessing that God offers in the spiritual places. Because He's granted it to us. He has given us that right as His priest under the authority of our high priest. Now we want to end with the rewards. It, this was probably the one I had the worst time with. Right? What is the rewards Jesus has for being high priest? He's the Son of God. He's, he's got everything. But are there any rewards particular to this? Go with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And look at verse 12. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. As his sacrifice of himself in his own blood, and as he entered into the holy of holies, the true holy of holies, by that blood, he was able to enter and receive the reward to never have to leave. You know, as I was studying the Old Testament years ago, I, I didn't know this until I was studying in class one day, that as a priest would go in to offer sacrifice, they would tie a rope around him. And do you know what that rope was for? In case some God struck him dead inside there, 
they weren't going to get him. They weren't chancing themselves. They weren't going to do that. That rope was to drag the body out with. They couldn't stay. They could only enter in one day a year. They had to leave. Whether that was by their own power or by a little tug of war, they were leaving. Jesus got the reward as high priest entering in by his sacrifice. He never has to leave. And we think about that. Well, that seems kind of absurd, Justin. Jesus was God. He's always, he's always going to be God. Yes. But he also took on flesh. And that had an effect. And he was allowed to enter in, to never leave. And that's wrong. Hebrews 8 verse 6 is wrong. I'll go ahead and tell you all that. I corrected it after the fact. So I apologize. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 12. Or 23. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 23. The former priests were many in number... Because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently. Because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. Talk about a reward. He gets to keep his priesthood forever. You know, I love, and I know Brother Michael's dad's a preacher for the church. Uh, one of my, that just astounds me. I think it's one of the most impressive things is, is Brother Gus Nichols uh, and his son Flavel filling the same pulpit. That's impressive to me. That's impressive to me. But you take men like Gus, his son had to step up because Gus was called home. He had to leave his priesthood. He had to leave his service. Jesus has the reward of having eternal priesthood, having it forever and never having to give up on that. And we're going to step out of Hebrews for just a minute as we look at this and go over to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and look at one result here that we find as a reward. Philippians chapter 2 in verse 8. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. His sacrifice allowed him to enter into the Holy of Holies, into his high priesthood. His sacrifice also placed him above all else. No name above his. To the point every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. What a reward he has for being faithful to his father. And we know that was hard on him. We think, we think about these things sometimes, and I know I do. I, I think about these things, and I think, well, it was, it was Jesus. Anybody ever say that as you, you look at his life? Well, he was Jesus. I have. Well, he knew he was coming to die. Yeah. But did that change anything on that night in the Garden of Gethsemane? When he bowed and prayed and prayed and, and it was like droplets of blood coming off him. When he looked at his three best friends 
and, and they keep going to sleep on him and he's, can't you stay awake with me? Can't you see how distraught I am? Yeah, he was God, but he was man. And what he was about to face is beyond anything that we can imagine. And through that sacrifice that he may take hold of his priesthood, he also takes hold of a name above all names. And because he did follow through, we have some rewards awaiting us. Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4, starting with verse 14. Hebrews chapter 4, starting with verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence... Draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. A great reward that we have as a result of Him being our high priest, He understands. You know, we sing that song, right? He understands. He does. He understands everything you've went through in your life. And we think about that. How can Jesus understand everything I've went through? He was God, yes. And he was tempted in all points like me and you. He knows what it's like to be hungry. He knows what it's like to be cold. He knows what it's like to be lonely. He knows what it's like to be rejected and neglected. He knows what it's like to be overlooked and undervalued. He knows what it's like to be you, even though we sometimes lose that. And what a reward that is for me, because He's not so far apart from me that I can't relate with Him that I can't draw near the throne with confidence. You know, we have in, our, in the brotherhood at, at years past, um, we have looked at things maybe a little askew in some of the congregations I've been a part of. We were like that old Pilgrim's Progress sermon, Spider on a Thread. Y'all remember studying that in school? And God was just had that pair of scissors just waiting to cut us off. And that's the way we've lived our life. That it's like God is sitting there waiting to strike us down and He's not. Now, is He a just God? Yes. But is He sitting waiting to get you? No. He wants you to come to Him. He wants you to confidently and boldly come towards His throne. And He has made a way for you to do that. That's a reward that we have because He understands our struggles. Let's flip back to Hebrews chapter 10 and see another reward we have from our high priest. Hebrews 10 and verse 14, we read up to 13 a minute ago, for by a single offering He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. His priest that reside under His authority are perfected for all time. Now that's not once saved, always saved. Don't get me confused. What that is, is we have the ability to be obedient and know where we're going. No Christian has to answer 
the question of are you going to heaven with I hope so or I might. We are told in scriptures to make our calling and election sure. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Paul knew where he was going. Peter knew where he was going. And brethren, we can know where we're going. Because he made that sacrifice for us and that reward and that promise. And the last thing I want us to see is that final reward of Revelation chapter 3 and verse 12. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 12. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. I don't know about you. Me and my wife bought our first house. I, I, you know, um, Michael announced we've been married 21 years. I'm 41 years old. We got married when I was 20. She was 18. We bought our first house. Hated moving into it. Hated moving into it. It was, you know, we loved having our own house, but to decorate and put up pictures and paint and, and carry stuff in and out and, we, you know, we said, you know, when we moved in there, we, we're, we're going to move one more time in our life to our, our retirement home, and that's it. You know, we've removed about six or seven times since then. Hate it every time. Packing all that stuff up, throwing all that stuff away, thinking, why in the world did I buy this in the first place, right? You know what I love is my promise of reward is that I'll be a permanent fixture in the true temple, in the true tent, as his priest. Tonight, if you can't say that you'll be a permanent fixture in the house of God because you have not obeyed the gospel call, tonight the opportunity is before you to do what God asks you to do to become His child. The opportunity is before you to start that life unto death of righteousness and faithfulness. If you have began that journey and you have found that you have stepped short of the line or you have crossed it, God is calling you back and giving you opportunity again to return home, to return to Him. As together we sing.